This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Anthony Patch is the man in the know, and the powers that be don't want him to go. Whoa. On the Kip Baker Show, you're listening to Truth Frequency Radio. Strange lids, blue ones are what you get. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome everyone to tonight's broadcast of the Entangled Radio Show with me, Kev Baker, and the main man himself, Mr. Anthony Patch. We're back, it's been another week, and we are raring to go, and I hope all of you out there are raring to go as well, and I can't thank you all enough for continuing to join us week after week you don't know how much it means to myself and of course the main man the driving force behind all of this mr anthony patch tony we're back again another week has passed brother yes indeed it's great to be with you and all of our friends in chat that are here today and everybody that's out there and the listening audience, as well as out there with uh, iHeartRadio. I always like to try to remember those guys because they got a big heart for us. Take it away, my friend. Are you just having a go at me? And and are you trying to remind me of what recently happened, Tony? I know you're not like that, right? No, I just do CPR by quantum entanglement on you. You do. You were my paramedic by quantum entanglement. You know, I was (laughs) trusting more of what you were telling me from a thousand miles away than the doctors that were round my bed. But that is for another night. Big shout out to everyone in the chat room. Robbie, Andrea, Molly, Rebecca. That's the names I can see. So many more in there. And we've got a special treat tonight, Tony, because it's not just me and you here. Let's welcome to the show. Joe. Joseph, how are you doing, man? You're over on the Anthony, the, the Anthony Pat show, or as I should say, the Entangled Radio Show. Welcome, man. Awesome. It, I th- yeah, Entangled with Uncle Tony. That's, That's what I'm it, saying. baby. Well, <laughs> my friend. Hey, it's good to be here, guys. Well, you know, we got to have three legs on this stool, and uh, we were on Wednesday with Kev, and unfortunately, Johnny couldn't make it. So, you know, we got to keep it in balance. We got to have this trinity of powers. So, welcome, my friend. Oh, no, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, one hectic week, but. All I can say is I'm I'm glad that we have the heart to do this. Hardy, har, har. <laughs> Now, I know for a fact that Joe Joseph said that on purpose. But, Joe, you know, like I hinted there, called it the Entangled Radio Show. And, Tony, we are kind of rebranding things around here. Do you want to talk to the audience about that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, we started off with using the, the name or the label of Entangled with our new magazine we have an online magazine called entangled and we have published two issues so far june july we have one coming out august 1st and we thought we'd take that and apply it to the radio show so that we have some continuity some branding so this is now the entangled program with anthony patch and kev baker and the occasional guest host joe joseph or johnny whistles or whoever else may straggle in the back door that eh, we deem to be of the brotherhood, so to speak. So, yeah, this is the Entangled radio program now. Oh, Tony, you can't say the brotherhood. You'll have all <laughs> of the people over on YouTube. They will they already think I'm in some kind of secret society. because that may, that that the tinfoil hatters uh, salivate. That's good, yeah. <laughs> now, just pull your black hood up over your head. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, Tony, we're on the light side here today, and 
Kev, Kev is in is laying back. He's in an undisclosed location in the northern reaches of Scotland. So we need to allow for him to have that laid back attitude because he's got five hours of radio to do today. Go ahead. Yes, myself and Joe, we will be on for five hours because after the Anthony Pat show or Entangled Radio show, I need to retrain myself now, Tony. We okay. will be going on to Freaky Friday. So remember, stay tuned for that. And then after that, there'll be Chris and Shiri Geo. No reason to go anywhere. And Tony, I'm going to hand it right back to you because I know there's a few things you want to get into tonight before we hit all the AI and all that kind of news. Yeah, so Joe, um, hold on because you're going to be with us and we're going to talk AI and I know you've got a lot of things you want to bring to the table. So you're not out of the game here, but I'm going to launch into just a short piece of uh, um Biblical scripture taken from Matthew, and specifically this is Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, I'm going to explain that a little bit, because there's some interpretations that can be you know drawn from that. And I'm going to give you an exposition that I'm going to read, and it's fairly lengthy. It's going to take me about three minutes to read it, but I want to give you one interpretation. The violent who take the kingdom, meaning heaven, okay, the violent who take the kingdom by force are those who have such an earnest desire for Christ that they let nothing stand between themselves and faith in him. These are pe people who so want to be entangled with Jesus Christ, to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit, to be as close to Christ in that personal relationship as possible, that even Scripture gets to the point of saying that it is similar to suffering violence, that they want to break down the walls to the kingdom to get as close to Jesus Christ as they possibly can. Now, that's a pretty radical picture. And when I you know, was shown this today, a couple of hours before the show, I was stunned because I had never read that before and had never heard that before. But this goes back to what we were talking about, Kev, on Wednesday. When we were talking about the enhancements. I don't want to call it the, the evolution. I want to call it the enhancements, the augmentation. Yeah, the other side wants to talk about transhumanism and plugging all these appliances into our bodies and uploading us into the computer. Well, if that's the agenda of the other side, what do you think God is going to do with us? And I'm talking about us that are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Yes, if you've never been to the Entangled radio program with Anthony Patch, Kev Baker, and Joe Joseph before. This is a Christian-based radio program, so thank you very much. But what I'm talking about here is that if you have the Holy Spirit within you, you will be augmented. You will have many steps ahead of technology, advancements in your mind, your heart, your DNA, and your soul provided yeah. to you through the Holy Spirit. So, Joe, go ahead. I think you got a comment coming in. Come no, I, I, to I totally and completely agree with you. That connection, if, if the way that I can explain it to those that don't don't understand or don't believe, is if you could imagine a connection, whether it be Wi-Fi, whether it be uh, Ethernet, it doesn't matter. But that connection is basically that pipeline is your Holy Spirit that gets you up to up to and between your intermediary between here on earth and up above, if you will, or in, in heaven or where God, God dwells or whoever you believe. But that's what that is. It's, it's actually, it's your intermediary. And, or, so it's important that you understand it in that perspective because when you do that, it kind of gives you something tangible to hold on to. Because a lot of people don't understand what that's all about and, and what the Holy Spirit is and why it was put here when Christ ascended. You know, so um, it's just it, 
to me, you know, it's pivotal that you understand that just as much as you understand how your computer hooks up to the internet in your house, you know, because if you don't know how it hooks up, then when it goes out, you have no way to troubleshoot. Same way here. You know, when you fall out of, when you fall out of, um, uh, away from your faith, let's just say, um, Mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily, Holy Spirit doesn't go away. That connection doesn't go away, but you need to know how to reestablish it, you know? So yeah, that's the, that's a general description that I like to use on that in a, in a way that it puts a, a human understanding to it, you know? Yeah. Kev, do you have a comment before I launch into reading this couple of paragraphs? No, but I mean, maybe we should look at this and it's a terrible pun to throw out there, but maybe people who are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, they're going to get a patch it's going to be like a software patch, <laughs> an upgrade. We're going to go from 512 qubits to maybe the 2048. That's a kind of analogy, but we're only working on 2% right now and maybe just a little tweak up to 10, 15% because I've seen what happens theoretically when you're at 100%. That film Limitless and that doesn't look good to me. So just a little tweak, I think that'll be enough. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, when there are errors, when there is decoherence in the software, they come up with a patch as a remedy. So guess what, folks? I guess I'm the remedy for you this evening. How's that? Oh, I like that. I do like that. (laughs) Well, for some reason, I ended up with that last name, and I guess we have to make the most of it. All right. Here we go. This is from the Bible Hub. This is Gill's exposition of the entire Bible, and we are again talking about Matthew eleven twelve. So bear with me for a moment. I'll read this quickly. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, from the time that he began to preach to the then present time, the kingdom of heaven, the gospel, and the ministry of it, first by John, then by Christ and his apostles, suffereth violence or comes with force and power upon the souls of men. It was attended with the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, and as appeared by its being the means of quickening persons. I want to emphasize that. Keep that word in mind, quickening persons, a quickening in the Spirit, okay? That they were dead in trespasses and sins, enlightening the blind, causing the deaf to hear, melting and softening hearts of stone, making of enemies friends to God and Christ, turning men from the power of Satan unto God, setting at liberty such as were slaves and vassals to their own corruptions. And in a word, in being the power of God unto salvation to many souls, and which was further seen in the manner it did all this, suddenly, secretly, powerfully, and effectually, and yet not against the wills of men. And by such instruments as the apostles were poor, sinful, mortal men, despised by the world, and attended with opposition and persecution, or sufferers of violence, which may be understood either of the vast numbers that pressed and crowded to hear the gospel preached. Great numbers followed John, when he first began to preach and baptize, still a greater number followed Christ, some to hear his doctrine, others to see his miracles, others to behold his person, others out of selfish ends, and some behaved rudely and indecently, or of the ardor and fervency of spirit, which appeared in some to the ministry of John and Christ, and in their desires and expectations of the kingdom of the Messiah, or of the gospel's suffering violence by the persecutions of its enemies, opposing and contradicting it, reproaching it, intimidating the professors of it, and seeking to take away the life of Christ, the great subject of it. So there's a little more, but I think you get the point here. There is violence involved here, folks, and this is what we're talking about, what we're seeing in the world now and what is coming before us. This is not the spirit of fear. I'm talking about the spirit of absolute power, 
Oh, yeah. Augmentation. Supernatural I'm, power. Go ahead, Joe. I'm glad you, you brought that up because Matthew wasn't the only one that talked about this. Um, Shaul, Paul, also wrote extensively about this and that power that you're talking about. And he specifically brought this up. This kind of complements what you're saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he, um, he was kind of talking about the struggle that he has and where he finds strength and what, that, what the Holy Spirit actually does for him and um, what it means. Because when you embrace it and when you plug in, the most powerful um, force, love, uh, actually kind of, it, it wells up in you. And when you use that. You know, I think we'll, I, I think we'll reconnect with Joe, okay. Tony. Something was breaking him up there. Absolutely. Did you hear him going a little bit garbled there? No, he was good here at this end. But yeah, let's reconnect. Go ahead. Let's reconnect. See if he's still about. Yeah. So bear with us. Are we still live? Well, he's not answering now, but Paul reconfirming what you're talking about. So there he is. is. Joe, I don't know. It went all garbled my end. Maybe it was just my end. I don't know, but crack on, man. Okay, yeah. So anyway, um, people often get uh, they when, when they when they look into you know the truth or they plug in. Oftentimes, it evokes hate, but when you plug in with the Holy Spirit, actually, it's love that that comes through, and that's the only way we're going to win uh, this battle. Uh, and almost, uh, if you want to call it, pass the test here uh, in this construct is to use love as your primary weapon, not hate. That's what the apostles did. And uh, Paul wrote about this and he described being plugged in. He said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profit me nothing. Charity suffers, uh, sorry, love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love um vaunteth not itself it's not puffed up it doesn't have it uh, doesn't behave itself unseemly it doesn't seek its own it's not easily provoked it doesn't think evil um it bear it, it rejoices not in iniquity but rejoices in the truth it bears all things it believes all things it hopes all things it endures all things Love never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they'll fail, and whether there will be tongues, they'll cease, and whether there will be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesize in part, but <clears throat> when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away these childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And that's a huge thing to understand. See, Paul knew when he when he plugged in, and you got to remember, he was a Pharisee. You know, he was Gamaliel's um, superstar student, and it took a lot for him to be torn away from that. There was prestige with that, and his calling, the Holy Spirit, was so strong. You know. And it, it, they needed 
the Holy Spirit and and God needed such a weapon, if you will, for the Gentiles to understand the message that they had to send somebody out there that knew how consistent things were and how the law worked and how the Torah was written and down to its uh, like the molecular level, the quantum level, if you would. And very few people understood that. Paul was probably the one that understood it more than anybody else. And that's why he was sent out to the Gentiles because it was a monumental task. Eventually, his ultimate goal was to go to Rome. He wanted to go right into the heart of Mordor and be like, hey, look at me. <laughs> and it eventually killed him. I mean, he went to Rome and, and, uh, and you know, just like all the apostles, they were executed. But, I mean, this is, uh, this was a heavy passage for me, not just in how it describes um, the knowledge that he had through that connection, but also what the, the, the biggest weapon in all this is. And it's not hate. And it's not animosity, and it's none of that. It's love. And until we understand that, we aren't going to break down these barriers and we're not going to solve our issues because it's very simple. If we love each other, there's a couple of things that happen, right? Instantaneously, you have personal respect. You can't have respect for one another unless you love each other, really. They go hand in hand. And the second thing is it evokes a sense of personal responsibility. And now all of a sudden... People are personally responsible. They respect one another. And all of the hate, all of the, the division, the divide and conquer, all of the weapons that are used against us now melt away instantaneously. All because of love. It's a very powerful thing that Paul described there. So uh, kind of a parallel, if you will, to what you were talking about in Matthew. Tony, are you there? Joe, are you there? Yeah, I hear you. Yep. I'm hearing you rather garbled, so I think you'll have to continue. I'll try and reconnect with Mr. Patch. I don't think he can hear us. Now, we can't hear him, Joe. So you're going to have to fly solo here because everyone sounds horrible to me. I'll tell you what. Why don't why don't we uh, why don't we reconnect and I'll I'll host the call. Why don't we try that? You you go for that, Joe, okay? Okay. Is that, you know, Love is that weapon, your connection or your your gateway, if you will, through the Holy Spirit to Christ. And that's kind of where I'm at. So Paul talked about it, too. And I find it very interesting that you brought up that passage in, Ma in Matthew, Tony. It was awesome. No, I'm, I'm glad you added, you know, context to it. And I want to just reiterate a guy that we cite an awful lot when we talk about tetrahedrons is, uh, you know, geodesic dome from Buckminster Fuller, his discussion. But he was a very broad sort of researcher. You might call him a Renaissance man. And he said in his last interview, last recorded interview, to nearly every question that was posed to him by the host, he would just answer, it's love. Don't you get it? It's all about love. It didn't matter what the question was. Exactly. He just kept repeating that. It's like, don't you get it? That's where all the power is. That's where is. everything comes from, is from the love, the power of love. Absolutely. And, and it really is that simple. That's why it's, it's, the only, it's the only answer. If we really, really, truly want to change things, that has to be the driver. If anything else is the driver, it's not going to work. It'll fail. That's why humanity has gone 
uh, in such cyclical patterns mm-hmm. uh, throughout creation, you know, since so, creation. So let me put you on the spot there, my friend. Um, I do a lot of discussion about things that I say, okay, it's time to define. Let's take a word. We've just been kicking it around. We've been throwing three or four new words around. Let's define it. Let's not just talk about the headlines. Let's not just talk in circular platitudes. Let's get down to the quantum level, if you will, and define things. So I'm going to throw it to you, man. Tell me your definition in 3,000 words or less. Love. Well, like I said, I think I think uh, Paul, I like I embrace Paul's definition of it. I do. I, I embrace Paul's definition of it. And it's just as he said, I'll, I want to read it one more time because I think this this is probably one of the most important passages to me in the entire Bible is this as far as understanding what the true weapon is, you know, and he said that basically. Um, he says, and, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge um, so that I can remove mountains and all this power he's got, right? Mm-hmm. But he doesn't have love. He says, I'm nothing. I'm empty. There's nothing there. I'm just this, this hollow shell, if you will. And he says, although I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, all this charity, right? And though all I give, and I give my body to be burned, but I have not love, it does me no good. Meaning all this effort that we throw in, all this fight that we throw in to um, to take away the power of the powers that shouldn't be, you can't do it without love, you know? And And we're we're rolling into the break, baby. This is Truth Frequency Radio. No hate, no hype, no fear. Real people. Real Radio. They got the head of Osiris at the Vatican. In September, they'll bring back to life again. It's true. What will we all do? All right, well, welcome back. This is the Entangled Radio Program with Anthony Patch. Kev Baker has got us covered on the 6, and our friend Joe Joseph, we are hijacking from the beginning of his marathon day with Freaky Friday later on this evening. So stay tuned for that, but I really enjoy the perspective and the context that Joe brings to us when we're talking about Scripture and putting things in a, you know, a real practical framework. You know, I was kind of putting him on the spot, asking him to define it. I'm sure. going to give you my definition real quickly here, and that is, you know, my dad, you know, everybody talks about how their dad told him this and told him that. Well, he told me when I was just a little kid, he said, be considerate. Be considerate of other people. That's the golden rule, right? So be considerate of other people. Exactly. That's, that's the tangible. Hey, don't go beat up on the guy next to you. Have some compassion. Be considerate. Think of other people before yourself, and then things will work out just fine. Yeah, selflessness, huge. Yeah. I mean, that's the way Jesus Christ won. Like I said, we're trying to beat down the walls, the barriers between us and him, so we can get as close to him and as personal, so we can hear him and we can emulate him and be like him, even in our fallen state. So it isn't some amorphous little thing. And I want to get into this sort of Sun Tzu uh, art of war discussion because, you know, things are pretty tough and it's going to get tougher. As I said at the beginning of the show, this is not about fear. God will equip us and already is. I'll tell you from personal experience, we joke, Kevin and I, about quantum entanglement. That's an enhancement. That's an augmentation. 
that's a supernatural manifestation of communication across thousands of miles between Kev Baker and myself. Now, many people who have the gift of the Holy Spirit, not because they're special, I'm not special, you know, we're fallen people and we went through our pivot point in life. We went through our anguish that we had a guest on, Kathleen, on two shows, Kev's and then mine for two hours last Friday, and talked about reaching that point of anguish in your life. It isn't just about the sinner's prayer. You have to reach a point, and thank God, literally, that you get taken to that point of being as low as ground down into fine nanoparticle particulates stripped down to nothing in anguish, because that's the point where you pivot to the light, to God, and that's where the rebuilding begins. It only begins once you've reached that point of saying, I give up. I give up myself. I give up the reins. I give up the perception of control. That's when the Holy Spirit can work with you, and that's when you make your prayer. That's when you give yourself over in anguish and say, I want to be as close to you. And you know that anguish was that beating down of the walls between you and heaven. Now, when you have the Holy Spirit and you get fired up like I am today, let me tell you, you want to kick some doors in. You want to be those special ops guys. They got all that body armor on, the Holy Spirit with the full armor of God. And you want to go up to that door and you want to breach that door and get as close to Jesus Christ as you can, because that's where the power is. You don't want to be left out in the dark with all these idiot mucky muck minions from Satan, with all their idiocy technology that I have talked about with Kev for three years now. We talked about it because that's the evidence of evil. You don't believe me? Go look at what's going on in the world. That's all the evidence you need that technology comes from Satan. Pure and simple. If you want to fight the technology, this is not pitchforks and torches. I'm talking about spiritual warfare in the heavens, literal spiritual warfare. Be the special ops guys that have the full armor of God and the Holy Spirit as your weapons and rise above all this nonsense that Satan is trying to make himself look omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, thinking that he's all big and bad and he's going to be kicking your butt. Guess what? The Holy Spirit laughs at him. And if you want that supernatural augmentation, and you want to be able to stand up with no fear in your heart, then you turn to Jesus Christ. It's real simple. Joe, go ahead. No, I, I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It really is that uh, that connection and that um, and that bond that gets you through and Totally. This is uh, this is Satan's world. It's a prison planet. Yep. That's the way I look at it. You know, this this construct that we uh, that we live in is just uh, it's been well, totally let me give you some power. Let me give you some example. If sure. people want to turn to Acts one eight. OK, I'm going to read it to you. Acts one eight. But you shall receive power described as dunamis. You will receive power, ability, efficiency, and might when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends, the very bounds of the earth. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or conceive by the power which is at work among us. That was Ephesians 3.20. This is in the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. It is to be taken literally. We can talk quantum physics. We can talk about quantum computers. We can talk about CERN. We can talk about DNA m manipulation and transhumanism all day long. That is all fear-based nonsense, and I've been talking about it for three years. Not because it's fear, not from the perspective of me being fearful or Kev being fearful or Joe Joseph being fearful. We're showing you the evidence because if you haven't made that decision yet, you better get with the program. 
because this is literally a spiritual battle. But you have more power than Satan. You can stand in the face of evil and laugh at it as God does in his derision of Satan. Yeah, because it was fear gets, only his tool. Fear melts away. You know, fear melts away and um, it has no power over you. No, when, none. When you, yeah, it's, it's really great. It, it's wonderful. It, you know, the, the biggest fear I find in people is the fear of death. It seems to be the overwhelming uh, fear. And when you embrace this, you understand, first of all, that um, let's just take the Bible, for example, consistent. From page one all the way to the end. Mind you, it was never written in such a fashion. These scriptures were never written in such a fashion to be read cover to cover. That's not the way it was. These were all piecemealed together into a book. Um, so understanding that, when you open up your heart, you learn how to read it. When you learn how to read it, yeah. it doesn't, it, it's, it's a consistent document. You find out that God's character is consistent from start to the finish. Everybody says, well, it's a bloody book. Meh. <laughs> right. Of course it is. When, when you look at it from a real perspective, not from a 21st century human perspective, but from a historical, a true historical perspective, you find out, oh yeah, God had to slay all the ites in the Bible because they were giants and they were genetically manipulated and they were eating everything up and they were causing all sorts of hell and havoc. Yeah. Okay. Well, that would make perfect sense. Here you have something that's been totally and completely um, bastardized and destroying his creation. Yeah. Got to take care of it. That's all that was, you know, yeah. all these, yeah. you know, and the golden calf. It's not like those people weren't warned, you know, they were warned. What's that? All right, so let's take it a different direction. 4G, sure. 4G and 5G Wi-Fi, okay? All that stuff we've all been talking about and jumping up and down, getting all excited and talking about full immersion and sentient world simulation. And yeah, you know, I'm kind of beating up on myself here. But you know what? You got to know the enemy. You got to know their methodology. Go to Sun Tzu. You got to study it. You got to know your enemy. Doesn't mean you're afraid of them. In fact, the more intel you have on them, the less fear you have because you identify their weaknesses and that's where you attack them. Agreed. Imagine, imagine in Sun Tzu, there's the general, okay? And his soldier comes up to him and he says, hey man, we're surrounded. They're all around us. The general turns to him and says, good, we got them right where we want them. Okay, that's a different paradigm. Sure, absolutely. Another great book to read if you want to understand their playbook. It's Propaganda by Edward Bernays, written in 1928, but still. Is that Bernays sauce? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Well, at least he got the sauce right. That's nice. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the playbook. That's what they use today to program you, to train got you. Got it. You know, people have honed, have, have kind of refined it since he wrote it. But if you read it, you'll be like, holy moly, you got to be kidding me. It's all right here in black and white. You have to understand the way that people think in order to make and affect any change in them. You have to understand them. You know, it's not that you have to be a doctor of psychology. That's all. That's just a piece of paper. Yeah. You have to have an honest, earnest thirst to do this stuff. And the only way you can and the only way you have strength and the only way you can get through is with the Holy Spirit in your heart. And you know what, Joe? Yeah. You and I I'm gonna I'm gonna beat up on Kev a little bit here. I'm ah. sorry. He can't he he can't really talk to us. Be quiet over there, Kev. Go curl up in the fetal position on in your chair in Inverness and be quiet. Okay? No, I'm kidding. He's he's doing great up there. Here's the deal. We're having a little technical issues, but here's the deal, Joe. You and I have been on this path with the Holy Spirit for whatever, a couple of years, five years, 10 years, whatever it is, doesn't matter. We are a little more studied, a little more experienced. We've had our multiple points of anguish, you and I, sure. in our testimony. And so we have learned. Kev is just starting out, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, and I don't want to you know, say speak out of turn as to where he is in his relationship with Jesus Christ, because that's his personal relationship with him. And if he ever wants to, you know, 
expound on that. He can do that when he wants to. But what I'm saying is you and I have perhaps a little more experience, and therefore we begin to get more energized. We begin to get that joy that comes to us for being not a servant, but a witness. Yeah, very much so. And it's pleasurable. Yes, we go through our ups and downs. We have our struggles. We have our attacks. It's a struggle. But it is absolute joy to be doing his work. That's the thing that I want to say that is pro, so <clears throat> profound with me that gets me so fired up now yeah. is the experience of in a completely different form, completely different level now, just in the last few weeks, of an, a remarkable outpouring of joy that I'm experiencing now in him. And yet at the same time, I'm talking about joy. I'm talking about kicking doors in. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing too, <clears throat> Christianity light speak teaches that, well, if you go to church, right. And you get baptized into the church by God, you're saved and everything's good. You know, you are under grace and pass the cookies while you're at it and pass the cookies. But, but it's not, that's not how it, that's not no. how it works. See, no, no. The reason why very few people make it to the next level, and it's true, it's not it's not a, oh, I've accepted it, and I go right back to my old way of life, and I'm in. Thank you. That, that's, Thank not, you. that's not how it works. No. The, the reward is great because the struggle is so hard. It is a grind to be able to get through in this world because you come to find out that you are not of the world. You can't be of the world no. If you embrace it, because the world it repulses you, it really, truly does. Oh, it hates and you. They, it, it, just like they hated Jesus Christ, they hate oh, us. Yeah, it instantly you become this the polarizing enemy. presence everywhere you go. Yep. You know you. Yeah. I'll give you an example. You know, family, instant fallout. It, it doesn't. E it doesn't even matter that. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. The, the the persecution, the judgment that you're under because you don't follow the status quo. You know, you don't follow the mainstream. Why? You know, I have a very different view of things. Well, you know, in my family circles, I'm considered a heretic. You know? Okay. Sure. I guess, Me too. I, guess I am. That's a proud club to be in. I think I'm 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 glad to be a card carrying heretic. You know, or or I get told that why you have a wall of Yahweh around you. Well, <laughs> hot damn. I'm so glad that's a pretty damn good wall to have around me. It's all good. You know, I get to Yahweh yeah. is the devil. Yeah, you talk, start talking crap like that. I mean, that just it just ends up. Uh, yeah, you've, it's uh, divisive. It's divisive. Obviously, you haven't done much study into things. And the thing is, and, and here's where I really credit Kev Baker for okay. enlightening me on how science was, that was really what helped solidify my faith. And let me say this too, in a moment of, um, of complete and total disclosure. I, my not faith, disclosure. no, we my, can't talk disclosure. Yeah, my, my, I struggle, you know, faith is hard. It is hard to maintain sometimes in this world when you're subject to persecution and the fact that, you know, you want to be accepted by family and you want to be, um, part of that, you know, the circle that you used to be in, you know? You stop having things in, in, in common with friends. It ends up being a real hard struggle. And that's where people start to go and fall away and say, ah, oh, you know, that's not God. That's not this. That's not that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Look, it is not. It, it's funny because uh, Jesus even talked about this uh, when he was here. He says, I haven't come here to you know, kind of bring people together. Hey, you know, we'll all bump fists and everything else. He says, I've come to divide. I've come yes. to pit, you know, mother against daughter and father against son and everything else. It's true. It's true. You have, 
you have to divide the camps in order to multiply the flock. In order yeah. to build the army of God, you first have to separate out yeah. the wheat from the chaff. That's right. right. And, and then and you then, can multiply the army. And the other thing is, is you can't get wrapped up in all of this religious talking note, the tradition, right. all these traditions that have been put in place. You have to understand that there is power in everything you do, every ritual you take part in. And believe me, I'm going to give you an example. You know, Christmas. Holy moly. That was my favorite damn holiday of the year. My wife is no still more. grieving. My wife no is more. still grieving over not doing that. <laughs> you know, and not taking part in that. It, and then we stopped that three, four years ago. Good. She's still heartbroken over it. You know, but but the fact it's is, tradition. It, it is apostate. It yeah. is flying in the face. It is basically, I, I can't even really describe to people just how offensive it must be to God and to, to Christ for taking Ra's birthday, the sun god, uh, Mithra, whoever you want to call it, because they go by me, goes by many names, oh, yeah. Satan, and you take that and you call it Jesus's birthday. I mean, you want to talk about and, and then, Right. And then, you know, you read the Bible, which again is not meant to be cover to cover. It takes you on a journey. When you start, when you open your heart, it actually takes you point to point across multiple books, across thousands of years to get the message, to solidify, yeah. to validate it for you. And Jeremiah tells you specifically, he says, don't do as the heathens do. Don't go into the woods. Don't chop down the tree and nail it to the floor and adorn it in silver and gold and dance around it and all this other stuff. Don't do it. That's what he's saying. You're going to, it's bad. Bad juju. Hey, Joe, you know? is the Christmas tree in Scripture? Uh, yes, it is in Scripture. It tells you don't do it. <laughs> that's it. Yes, that's where there it is. There you go, it was, baby. It was a specifically don't do it. There you go. When you look at the history of it, right? That's it. You find, out, it. That, you find out that on December 25th, the, as the story goes in Egyptian lore, Ra cut his colognes off in a sacrifice, right? He yep. cut his colognes off. And so um, what happens from there on out, each year, people would take silver and gold balls and hang them on trees. Careful there. Careful there. We're the FCC. The FCC is trying well, the, to break in. When I say balls, I mean like, you know, the balls that you put, put on your Christmas tree, the Christmas balls, the, oh, okay. the glass Thank balls. You. Okay. So okay. they take silver and gold balls and they hang them on the trees to represent that right and then they put the presents underneath this big phallic so it's meant to the tree represents Ra's <clears throat> private yes. part yes and then the balls they hang on there to represent his sacrifice that he made cutting his colognes off now isn't this just a fine example of not only is it in our face but also how subtle satan is oh. the father of lies that he would twist around the birth of Jesus Christ to his own devices. And this is what he does in every single aspect of our lives. Absolutely. He flips everything that God creates to his own deceptive and very subtle methodologies. Satan, of can, things appear around. As, Satan can appear as an angel of light. Yes, indeed. And he, he was. Can appear, he, he is he, not the king of deception. Deception doesn't work unless it's believable, right? That is correct. Right. Well, thank you for defining that, because we like to define things around here. Yeah, this is beautiful stuff, my friend. I'm so glad you're on the show today. This is about power. That's what it we're talking is. about here today. And you have to ask yourself something simple. Do I love God more, or do I love the traditions of the world? It's very simple, but you have to, you have to ask yourself that, and it's not... God doesn't want you to love him out of servitude. He wants you to love him because you love him out of your free will to do so. Consequently, if you love the world, you're not going to make it to the next level because you won't like the next level. If you love the world, then, then be there. 
No problem. Okay. He's not going to. I got to interrupt you. Got to interrupt not. you. Rebecca, thank you for posting this. This is another individual that I'm quantum entangled with is Rebecca Gray. She submits into the Entangled magazine multiples of scriptures into each publication, and I thank her for that. I was just thinking this. John 14, 12. This is something that I've been having a lot of discussions with off the air about this. He that believeth in me. Okay, this is Jesus Christ speaking. He that believeth in me, the works that I do, he do also. And greater works than those shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Jesus Christ is talking about, I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to ascend to heaven. I will be at the right hand of the Father. But you know what? You who will then be, because of Pentecost, you will be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will give you greater power on the earth, part of the system, hated by everyone even more than they hated Jesus Christ, but you will do greater works than Jesus. Jesus performed all the miracles we've heard about, that even the secular world talks about the miracles of Jesus. You talk about augmentation. You talk about supernatural. You talk about putting on some incredible armor and being equipped with some incredible weapons beyond CERN absolutely. colliding particles. Oh, We're absolutely. talking about greater works than even Jesus Christ did, and Jesus Christ is the one that's announcing and proclaiming that to us. That's Grab that. right. Grab that and run with that is what I'm telling you people, and I'm do talking to myself and Joe and Kev as well. We have to grab onto this promise, this declaration. We are a step above the power of Satan. Don't and let Stan him think you think that you you have to bow to him because he's got all this technology. You, it's a load know, of crap. You need to stand tall and be proud of the fact that you embrace. Christ and you embrace God because you will be vilified. But understand this, you have power over all of it. And when you embrace that, none of that matters. Look at you could be persecuted. You could be beaten. You could be put to death. It doesn't matter. None of that matters because the promise, my friends, is so great. And you will make it to the next level. But mark my word, if you embrace the world, you ain't going. It's that simple. And this Christianity light that's being preached is just absolute baloney. It's bunk. It is, because now, the church today separates you from that personal relationship. You know, this is the whole reason for the Vatican, but the other churches are just as bad. But the Vatican, the, the Pope himself— puts himself up as the intermediary, the intercessor between us and Jesus. Jesus is the intercessor between us and God. There is to be no human being between us and Jesus Christ. The Pope separates us from Jesus Christ, does not bring anybody closer to him. He blocks access. The churches block access. What you are supposed to be, and this is what Jesus was saying, is you don't need a church, you don't need a structure, you don't need a man-made organization. Nothing. All you need is a personal relationship with him. That's Forget right. about all the other don't garbage call, that God is— that, Call that no one your father but your father in heaven. It's really yeah. that simple. we got to go to break, and when we come back, much more with Uncle Tone and, uh, and Kevin, myself— on your protection from deception, truthfrequencyradio.com. Got a little story about Christmas when we come back. You are now tuned into the truth frequency. We are TFR. TFR. Truth Frequency Radio.
as a bell. Demons are what you get. Welcome back, everyone. We're when moving into our number two right here on the Entangled Radio Show with me, Kev Baker, the main man around these parts, Mr. Hi. Anthony Patch. And there he is, our very special guest tonight, Mr. I'm your Joe. token hijacker. Joe, you have been on fire tonight. I've been ah. sitting back. I've been listening to you. The connection's got better, and you really are, man. You're hitting some great points Tony is delighted with you coming on here and hijacking his show. You're trying to hijack him for Freaky Friday. And you I'm know what? I'm totally trying to hijack him for Freaky Friday. I'm because, just going to give it back to you, dude. Well, because, I mean, this is this is kind of important to understand because you're not going to be successful in this fight until you, you understand and embrace it. And it's hard. I'm telling you guys, I know it. It's hard. It is a, it, it is a slog day in and day out to be able to kind of muscle your way through this fight, but it's worth it. I And, you know, interestingly enough, a lot of people look for validation and for evidence, if you will. First of all, there's plenty of evidence, archaeologically, spiritually, uh, that validate what we're talking about. But understand this. You don't need a Ouija board. You don't need all these intermediaries, these ghost hunting parties, all that kind of stuff. To, to see this. All you need to do is just plug in. All you need to do is truly open your heart and be that light. And I guarantee you that you will see things that will make you uh, your heart palpitate and stop. I mean, it's crazy what happens when you become uh, a target. You will be a target when this happens because, look, at demons don't go after those that aren't a threat. Same thing, you know, tactically speaking, you talked about the art of war. Why would you waste your time and your your assets and your resources on something that's no threat? You're not going to do that. You're going to focus on the threats. Well, when you become a light bearer, if you will, you become basically this beacon that is a magnet that draws this stuff to you to the point where I will tell you uh, there has been stuff that's manifested to my wife and I and even my daughter that – would make your freaking hair stand up on end because we're threats because we talk, we talk about these supernatural entities all the time. The thing that I need to get this through to, to get through to people is these things are not your friends when they manifest themselves. Like when you see grandma during a seance, that's not grandma. That's a demon. Gra Grandma's not there right now at the demon. You're talking to a demon. These demons can look like them. They can talk like them. Understand that time does not, they're not in this prison of time that we're in, this time bubble. So they they know all this stuff. They can go and they can act just like grandma, sound like grandma, look like grandma, tell you things that grandma would know, but it's not grandma. And it's all meant to deceive you, Kev. It's all meant to deceive you. Well, so look, look at my personal story. I mean, Tony, yeah. I went yeah. to the house of Alistair Crowley. Now, we talk about John Dee and Ed Kelly. I warned you about that. Enochian magic, right? Alistair Crowley using the very same kind of magic. And, of course, nowadays we talk about CERN. They've got the technology with D-Wave to actually crack open these portals. But there I was, quite blasé, nonchalant, marching into Alistair Crowley's old home, Calling out spirits in that place. You crazy, now, crazy man. I can't say for definite that I took something home with me from there. Oh, but when you I took something home, all right. When I look back in hindsight, my life definitely hit a curve at that point. L look at so, it this uh, way. Yeah. yeah. Look at it this way. You may not have necessarily carried something home with you. Although there's no such thing to me as demons haunting a house or a ghost hounding a house. They they follow the person. They they attach themselves to people, not things. The the thing that you did is you opened a door. And one thing that we've learned, right, because we can use quantum science as yep. as validation of this, you open a door that's not closing. Because these things don't again are not stuck in time like we are in this time bubble. So once you went and once you opened that door, 
It's always open. It is an open doorway for these demons to just come and mess with you anytime they want. And you know, That's Carol, why it's, Carol it's, in the chat, she doesn't even know what I've been up to, Joe. And for anyone out there, because I just assumed myself and Tony had the same listeners, but I went to Alistair Crowley's home on Loch Ness with a family member and a friend and we did. We called out the spirits there, and bear in mind, he cast a magic spell where he didn't close the portal, and um, that led to, well, a series of events that seen me ended up in hospital, right. turning to Jesus and getting a totally new perspective on the world. And here's the other thing, too, is that it's not, you can't close the portal. You can't close the portal. That's a deception. Once you opened it, it's open. You may have closed, like for us, okay, yeah, it's closed. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. But to them, no, 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 no. It, once the door is open, it's always open. And now you have this other doorway that you have to defend, that you have to defend. I'll give you another example. Another thing that opens a door is alcoholism, right? I, I am an alcoholic. You, once you are, you always are. It's The door is always open. It never shuts. It's always there. You always battle it. Once you open that door, there's something you have to defend against. Right. It's a demon. That's why they call them spirits. I'm going to go drink some spirits, if you will. That's how they say it in Scotland. They say spirits. And and so once you do that now, you know, you're defending against that, against those <clears throat> spirits, the, the spirit of Christmas, if you will. That right there, you've opened a door. You may not realize it, but you've opened a door. We are one of the very few. This is the humanity is. This is how dumb humanity is, right? <laughs> we teach our children from day one that it's okay to lie. It's okay to lie, right? Yeah, Santa coming. Claus. Yes. Santa Claus. The Tooth Fairy. The Easter Bunny. All of these things, right? Oh, it's okay to lie. Instantly, you've opened that door to your children. You have instantly having to give them something to defend against that they're not equipped to defend against. You've already set them off on the wrong foot. And they don't trust you because you lied to them. Exactly. It is totally and completely counterproductive. You know, another reason why um, uh, I'm going to I want to share a story with you guys about Christmas, because this just illustrates the point of how apostate it truly is. And again, you have to look at this just like you investigate 9-11 and you do everything else in this in this slog of a fight. You have to totally and completely take your biases out of the picture and follow the truth because the truth truly is the story. And so what does the Bible say about Christmas? And and does our Heavenly Father, does, does he celebrate the birth of his only son? You know, because many people are aware that these holidays like Easter and, and Halloween and Christmas aren't in the Bible you know, as far as to celebrate, they're actually pagan in nature. And to many, these facts really don't matter because after all, they believe and they don't celebrate the holiday like the ancient pagans, you know, and Jesus is the reason for the season. Ha! And and as long as as Jesus's birth is rejoiced over and, and then with a sprinkle of Santa Claus for the children, God will understand. Right. That's what they say. And and you really think about this. Did anyone in the New Testament celebrate the birth of Christ? No. Did the, the biblical record, of course, is silent when it comes to that. Yet people reason that God must accept Christmas because we have such good feelings about it. Yeah, we feel good. We cherish fond memories of the holiday, you know? And so, all those wonderful movies. Absolutely. So God must have fond memories too, right? Yeah. No, you know, God's memories, first of all, go way beyond our capabilities since he lives in eternity. Read Isaiah 57, 15 for that. You know, what if God's memory of Christmas included the noise of pagans who celebrated their idol with chanting or with screaming from those, uh, you know, sacrifices, you know, his, his children, uh, spiritual children known as Christians being put to death, all these, uh, uh, Christians being put uh, burned at the stake. You know, the Bible says the eternal hears the voice of those martyred for his name, crying under a heavenly altar, asking that their deaths be avenged. And and, and where you hear that, right? Revelation 610. 
And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood and those who dwell on the earth? I mean, it's it's crazy how much people will defend these traditions. I mean, and what points they'll go to and how they justify it in their heads. It's crazy. So I want to illustrate a point a little bit by by sharing this story with you. And uh, I found this over on BibleStudy.org, and it's pretty cool. It says the following fictional story will help explain some of the issues involved with holidays such as Christmas that are not condoned by the Bible. Imagine it's Germany during the height of Nazism in 1937. Churches throughout the country are in trouble. Young people who go to church want to leave and join the Hitler Youth. Businesses that even seem to be Jewish because they observe a seventh-day Sabbath are failing. Some ministers, however, believe that if they only make some minor changes here and there to how the church operates, they'll be able to survive what is happening in the country. For example, on April 20th of each year is Hitler's birthday, which many joyously celebrate. And since it's unclear exactly when Christ was born, although we can pretty much kind of narrow it down to a time period, some ministers and religious leaders choose April 20th as the time to commemorate Jesus' birth. And they also figure that if they take the cross and add just a few bends to it, that it would look surprisingly similar to a swastika. And they decide to refer to their new creations as Christ's cross. And with changes to the church come growth in numbers. And people soon find themselves holding their right arm rigid in front of them at an upward angle so that they can show that they're giving God glory as they march around the cross. And most people don't care that the commemoration of Jesus' resurrection has been moved to occur on that exact day when the glorious Third Reich was started. And churches which adopt these new ways in Germany operate and thrive while others are persecuted and, and even killed. And the new practices are so popular that even years later, many people are still found celebrating the birth of Jesus on the 20th of April. And then one day, someone visits the church and does his best to try and inform the group about their holidays originated and where they came from. And after hearing the explanation that people, uh, after hearing the explanation that the people, they're not shocked. I mean, after all, in, in their minds, terms like Hitler and, and Nazi are, are meaningless I mean, who cares, they think, how people many years ago worshipped what they thought was God. And what matters is, is that what they do today is for the worship and glory of God. And each person in the church has their own wonderful memories of April 20th with warm and joyous feelings. And their trip down memory lane are abruptly interrupted when the man visiting the church asks them a, pro a, pr a profound question. What are God's Christmas memories? So think about that. How do you think God would react if people decided to commemorate yearly his son's birthday on the birthday of Hitler? And how do you suppose the Eternal would feel if the day symbolizing the Reichs or the Nazis party's resurrection or resurrection were used to symbolize the resurrection of Christ? You know, would God be pleased with his children if he saw them sincerely trying to honor the sacrifice of his son using a swastika? Wouldn't most want to study to find out how their customs honoring God and his son got started? Think about that. In our fictionalized tale, as April 20th Christmas seemed so wonderful and magical, filled with warm feelings and love. You know, 2 Corinthians 11, 14 says, And no wonder Satan, their master, can disguise himself as an angel of light. The Christmas spirit to them is a spirit of sharing and giving to others. Anyone who would dare to be opposed to such wildly acceptable practices must mean something's terribly wrong with them. The allure and temptation to celebrate Christmas on April 20th with its lights and music and festivities enjoyed even by those who know nothing of God would be most powerful. You could try with all your might, but still fail to convince most people that the Nazi origins of what they're doing should be a warning to them to not keep that holiday. You know, so to a new, an early New Testament church, God's perfect will did not mean that they couldn't ce celebrate holidays like Christmas. The later universal, universal Roman-based church, however, deceived the masses into believing that they could hang on their, onto their pagan traditions of worship, but rename them as being God's will. And Jesus warned in those uncertain terms that there would be those who would worship him in vain. You know, Mark, Mark 7, uh, verses 7 and 8 says, 
Well did Isaiah's prophecy concerning you hypocrites, as it is written. The people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. And that's exactly what we have here, Tony, is people simply don't understand that to celebrate the holiday with all its trappings is a total lie and that Christ can never be put back in <clears throat> Christmas since he was never there to begin with. And God's no, memory wasn't. Yeah, God's memory doesn't allow him to celebrate the Christianized pagan holidays. The world is created to honor him. I mean, really, that's, that's yeah. what it's all so about. So what, what, in your estimation, blocks people from breaking out of that norm of the world, such as you have done, I have done, to not celebrate Christmas in the manner of the world? Why do people not break out of that? What is holding them back? You know, I, I have to say, <clears throat> it's really some peer pressure. <laughs> there you it's, go. It's hard to be the black sheep. You know, uh, Veronique in the chat room said uh, something to the effect of, let me, I got to go back up a little bit because I think this is kind of important. Well, Easter is about Jesus getting tortured for us and he wanted us to remember him with a meal. No, that's not really true. Actually, what you're doing is you are celebrating what's commonly referred to as Ishtar Day. Over in the Middle East, uh, they actually laugh at Western Christianity for celebrating something that has to do with the goddess of fertility. Um, Ishtar, or uh, it was actually San Ramus, the wife of Nimrod, who when she died, the legend goes, she was uh, came back uh, in the in an egg the egg lands in the euphrates river out comes san ramus reincarnated as ishtar the goddess of fertility who at her first miracle changes a bird into an egg laying rabbit and that is how the whole easter bunny tradition mm -hmm. comes along exactly. the dying of the easter eggs the dying of the Easter eggs. Everybody has such fun doing it with their kids. The true origins of that is on that day, Ishtar day, the priests would take women, virgins, up to the altar and impregnate them. And then nine months later, they have the babies. Three months after that, why, look at this, it's Ishtar day again, where they sacrifice the babies on the altar and dye eggs, the eggs from the, the bunny, in the blood of the babies. And there you have your dying of the eggs. Your 40 days of Lent, right, is the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was the offspring of Nimrod and Sam Ramus, and he was killed by a wild boar. So you have 40 days of weeping that occurred after he did that because he was the great hunter. And then at the end, you eat ham in celebration of, or... <laughs> Tammuz overcoming the wild boar, almost seeking vengeance on that wild boar for killing Tammuz. 40 days of Lent, and everybody on Easter Sunday, what do they eat? They eat ham, because that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're celebrating your victory over that wild boar, you know? And, and, it's, and by the way, it's unclean food, you know? That's just, that's the other thing. And because you're also talking about the hunter, the hunter god, Cernunos, Yes. which rolls right over into CERN, which they borrowed their name from CERNUNOS for. Absolutely. So, so you see, Tony, what, what happens is, is one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another, and it becomes a journey. And then you truly understand the apostate nature. You also truly understand how oh, so few people are going to make it. The Bible says that when... Jesus returns, there will only be 144,000 of his people on the planet when he comes back uh, alive. 144,000. How many people live on the planet these days? Over 7 billion. That's a very small proportion of people that will be alive that are his people when he comes back. And I will add to that when we get into the discussion of the rapture, which is always a hot button, contentious discussion. But it doesn't matter what we're talking about pre trib, mid trib, post trib, doesn't matter. No. Just the act of the rapture itself, there will not be that many people taken in the rapture. Exactly what you're talking about, my friend. Yeah. 
Yeah, none of that. See, that that to me, when you start going down that road, the the, the rapture thing and everything, people yep. debate over stuff like that. It's a waste of time. It's a distraction. It don't is. worry about it. No, no, I don't either. This is the discussion that I've been having for the last couple of weeks with some of my closest friends and confidants in this, and that is don't worry about the rapture, okay? Whether it's going to happen or not, it's defi divisive. When it's going to happen or not is divisive. Don't get caught up in this trap of divisive, circular debates because it takes your eyes off of Jesus Christ. Okay? Absolutely. There? I, I, could, I couldn't agree with you more. So couldn't agree the with question you more. I was, is— uh, the, mute, the, the mute's a terrible that's okay. thing. Terrible. So, so the question that I put to you is why don't people want to break out of this paradigm of Easter and Christmas? And it's all, like you said, it's the crowd mentality. People who are drawn to being part of a group, the worst thing that can happen to them is being kicked out of that group. Right. To be seen as different. It's that normalcy bias. It is that wanting to fit in. Why do people stick to fashions and trends and the latest electronics that they absolutely have to have and will kill somebody to get it first. Yeah. Humans okay, are tribal. That cried, yeah, it's tribal. Yeah. It's difficult to break out of it. But, you know, you're talking about all these aspects of you accept the Holy Spirit. You go through that anguish. You go to that pivot point. You go to, you know, to the light instead of the dark. You go to Jesus. And then all of a sudden your whole world changes and everybody hates you. Some. Somebody standing outside objectively would say to you, Joe, or to me, why would I do that to myself? Things are already bad enough. Why would I want to compound those things by having all these people that I'm around that I'm trying to fit in with, including my family? Why would I want to lose my kids? Why would I want to lose my relatives? Why would I want to be set apart? Well, it's real simple. It comes right back to the wide path that leads to destruction oh, or yes. the narrow path that leads yeah. to salvation. It is a question of your soul. Where is it going to go? Are people that you associate with, including your own children, and in my case, I'm speaking of my own children. Yeah. Okay. I have lost my own children to this. Why would I want to do that? I don't want to do that. But it is the end result of their choice. I pray for them. I pray that the seeds that I planted to them of going to the light, going to God, going to Jesus Christ, will grow and manifest in them. But they have to live their own life and of course. come to a personal experience of salvation with him on their own path. Meanwhile, I have to stick to my narrow path that I have chosen with him because I want my soul saved. I want my children's souls to be saved. But in the meantime, there can be conflict because we have free will, and they have that right to their own free will. But the point is, why suffer the separation from mankind? Because it is the only path to everlasting life for your soul. That's the reason that you put up with all this stuff in the meantime. Oh, abs absolutely. You know, I, uh, the, the biggest thing that I find is void is respect for people's beliefs and free will. Right. So, yep. so that, that's, that's one thing is a, I don't knock anybody for doing what they want, believe what they want. Knock yourself out. It's okay. It's okay. I love and respect you regardless. I can't stand to see Christianity vilify um, people based on their sexuality or anything else. Look it. You can think what you want and say what you want. That is your own business. Do what you want. You have to understand. Love has to be that foundation. If we don't, if you don't love somebody who is homosexual, if you don't love somebody that may be black or may be rich or whatever criteria that gets put in the way that divides us, if we don't love people for their differences, you know, then we have nothing. We're just not going to we're not going to even make a dent here. You, We have to love each other because we are all different. 
We don't want, imagine how crazy and how boring life would be if we were all just automatons the same, we lived the same, we enjoyed the same things, our houses looked the same, everything was the same. Could you imagine how boring life would be? How just mundane? Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh it's horrible. And we're not supposed to be the same. And no. even, even in the structure of the angels themselves, they have a hierarchy. They have different angels for different purposes and different powers. But getting back to this whole idea, you're talking about behavior and choices. People have made choices. And so you're, you're, I, I don't hey, want to hold, hold on, Tony. We're up against a break. So okay. we'll pick you that up on the other out, side. We'll go to break because yeah, it's uh yeah, this is just flying by, isn't it? Holy it is. moly. This is great. Yeah. And, and again, you know, everybody has their own beliefs and everybody has to respect or should respect people's beliefs, their values, because everybody's journey is different. Our paths are different. And we have to understand that. We're going to break. When we come back, more with Tony Pat. No hate, no hype, no fear. You're listening to Truth Frequency Radio. We are TFR. Is that Robbie? Is that Robbie music over? Robbie, thank you. You're in the chat room. So is Cheryl, his wife. Fantastic music they provide for this show. This Wonderful. is the Entangled program with Anthony Patch, Kev Baker, covering our six, being the producer from his fetal position in Inverness, Scotland, <laughs> and my good friend, my on fire friend. My good friend in Jesus Christ, Joe Joseph, and I'm so thankful that you've brought your, your passion to the show today. We had a whole different agenda for this show today. You know, Kevin and I talked for half an hour before the show, and we were talking about, yeah, let's do this, let's do this. It's all gone. All, all just thrown out the window. Might as well even forget we even well, talked no, about wait, it. Wait. Wait a minute. Because, Wait no, that's a minute. the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit well, working. Well, you, you act here. as though time... You're here when it truly isn't because Tony, we have three more hours after this. We have oh. plenty of time to talk about what you need to talk about if you just <laughs> if you just come on over to the other side. Utterly yeah, shameless. Side. Utterly You're shameless. Joe. All right, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I had other plans for tonight, but um, okay, I'll go with it until I pass out and fall out of my chair. Okay, so Netflix will just put the next Netflix away for Tony for tonight. <laughs> And uh, and and that's and and we'll just. I don't watch TV, <laughs> and I don't watch Netflix. It's a bunch of. All right, I got a transition here. Okay, okay, let's do it. So we were talking about, we were talking about why people want to separate. You know, they don't want to separate from the crowd. They don't want to get beat up. You know, I don't want the Holy Spirit because then everybody hates me. Well, guess what? You go to the dark. That's what you're going to get. You're going to get the dark. You go to the light. Hey, you get all the bennies, like immortality of your soul instead of going to, you know, going to Hades. A um, friend of mine sent me an email today. I get lots of emails. It's wonderful. Thank you, everybody out there that sends me these emails. There's so many of them. I can't respond to them all, but I read every one of them. But she sent me a video clip of the Lake of Fire. Okay, Wyoming, there's a fire, there's a landfill that's on fire and the methane's burning. And they actually have a lake of fire in the middle of this thing. And it's like, okay, well, eh, there's an example on a small scale of what it's going to be like at the end of the you know, thousand year millennium. And then evil, all evil, embodied by Satan, gets thrown into the lake of fire, gets chained up and tossed in. 
Okay, so we know the end of the story, but there's an awful lot going on between now and then, and a lot of souls that have to be saved. And the reason that we are on the air today talking about this is not for us to hear ourselves talk. Yeah, for real. Okay, this is about you guys that are listening to us, and we are not preachers, we're not prophets, we're no better than you. We are scum on the pond, like everybody else. Yep. We are okay. the bottom feeders. So I'm not talking down and being condescending. I'm not being a preacher. I'm not standing on a pedestal. I'm screaming at people today because I'm on fire with Joe and Kev because the Holy Spirit is putting that quickening. That's in Scripture. I read it to you. The quickening in our hearts because of the times that we are in. This is not fear. This is about there's only so much more time left before right. Jesus comes back like a lion, and he's going to kick butt this time in the form of judgment. He doesn't come in as a passive little lamb. He comes through here to take care of evil for once and for all. And if you're in the camp of evil, guess what? You're going to get your butt kicked. Absolutely. You know, another uh, a way that you can combat this, and um, the Bible says, be not unequally yoked, right? It's I really didn't understand what that meant until yeah, it's, a, it's applied to your wife. It's applied to who yeah. you get married to, but it's beyond that. So go, go ahead. There's a lot more to it than just who yeah. you marry. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's who you associate with, who you uh, befriend, all that stuff. It, it's huge. The the thing with um, Ange and I is that um, she, when I met her, uh, I mean, I was as far from, Christ as you could possibly imagine. But over the course of time, um, she subtly showed me, you know, as, as much as I was willing to accept it, um, the, just how all of it was true, you know, and, and slowly but surely studying the Bible. And I understood and I understand now, especially over the last year, just how important that being equally yoked is. Because what happens is, is through that, you have somebody that basically provides checks and balances. You provide checks and balances to each other and accountability and, and that support. balance and the balance. Right. It's so critically important. You have to have an encourager. How yeah. would you, wh which would you prefer? Would you let, let's just talk, you know, um, man and woman. Okay. Sure. Husband and wife. So picture this guys, I'm talking to the guys out there. Do you want to have a nag who's dragging you down and tearing you down, questioning everything about your faith, telling you that you're an idiot for reading Scripture to believe in Jesus Christ? You know, you got a nag who's saying, we can't even go to a restaurant because people don't want to talk to you. They don't want to hear from you. They don't even, because you don't participate in the sports talk, you don't know who the latest and greatest MVP is out there. You can't in, engage in talking about the latest TV shows. You're a bore. I don't want you coming to dinner with me and my friends. Get out of here. Or would you rather have the flip side to that and have a woman in your life who, who upholds you, encourages you, speaks with you, and speaks to the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, and here's the Holy Spirit speaking to her and passes on wisdom to you to help you and uphold you. I'll tell, I'll take number two, thank you very much, okay? I'll take the one that is encouraging and upholding me, and I will do the same thing for her. So women, yeah. you can ask the same questions, run the same scenario. Equally yoked, take that rather than some shrew or some guy who all he cares about is laying on the couch and watching football all day. How far is that going to get you in life? Yeah, it, does, it certainly doesn't get you happiness, you know. It's the same thing with, like, money. All, that, all that's artificial. you, know, you got to be in it for the right reasons. And once you are, I mean, you basically become much stronger. That doesn't mean, by the way, to isolate yourself from other people who might not believe and, and things like that. That's no, not, no, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. That's not that's not it. But but what you do is, is when when you embark on these journeys to do so alone is very, very difficult. It's hard. I mean, it's so it so is. And you need both of you. You yeah. need both of you. Oh, to stand man. I mean, this. that's why there was Adam and Eve. Why was Eve created, Joe? 
why? What was? What does Scripture say? Why? God, I, I'm sorry, man, but I'll tell you, the Holy Spirit has really got a hold of me today. Uh, and, you know, this is the way it's going to be from now on, folks. Okay? What you're hearing coming out of my, my mouth and Joe's mouth is the way it's going to be from now on. Okay? This show, this show is going to be just like this. The Holy Spirit. It may be quieter. It may be more mellow. Oh, it may be more deliberate, and we'll talk about technology and stuff. But I'll tell you what, there is no time for playing games anymore. There's no time for, you know, silliness on this show. But I'll tell you what, Joe's going to tell you why Eve was created. Oh. Go for it. What a, what a story. I got to pull this up. Um, a lot of people may not understand that outside of the Bible— there are many other books, uh, and they they all have nuggets of info that actually kind of bring it all together, if you will. Talk uh, faster, my friend. We only got fifteen minutes left. Talk oh, fast. Oh no, we do not. We I have know. Three but hours. For this show, for this show, come oh. on, spit it out, man. Okay, so Adam and Eve um, were created. To now he goes slower. Would you get going? I can't really. I'm kind of losing it here. It takes more than that. <laughs> well, they, they, you know, they're a team. They complement each other. Yeah, they do. Um, Help the book, mate. Of, the Help book of Adam mate. and Eve. The Help book of Adam. Yeah, exactly. The the book of Adam and Eve was actually considered the um, the moral the the oral record, if you will, of what Adam and Eve went through. It was passed down. Yes. Holy moly, man. You want to talk about an unbelievable story? Read the book. There's two books, two parts of it, folks. And I, I, it would take me too long to get into it. All I can tell you is what a struggle that they had to persevere through. But they did it together. The entire time they did it together, they were their strength and they were their weakness. But they were together in all of it. And it was so critically important that that was there. Because they wouldn't have survived. Well, they didn't survive. But, I mean, they wouldn't have survived um, without that support for one another and that deep love that existed between them. Um, yeah, people don't understand that they, they committed suicide world. like a half a dozen times because of just how horrible it was. Horrible the fall was. Yeah. You were with God and then you get put here on the earth? Excuse me. What's what's this? You know, like my friend L.A. Marzulli says, not so fast, citizen. You know, I'm 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 Adam and I'm looking at Eve It's like, wow, this ain't cool. I don't want to be here. Yeah. Like you said, they committed suicide. They were so grieved by everything. I mean, think about here you are an interdimensional light being, for lack of a better term. And. and and you get thrown down on this rock. Into this, in this prison planet rock. Oh, here I am. Oh, my gosh. Uh, this flesh. Ugh. And I'm I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. What is that? You know? Oh, man. It just ended up uh, total and completely devastating them. And they really had to work through a lot. And that's... Uh, but you, you read that book and there's also a promise. God says, hey, don't worry... In 5,500 years, he says, I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what's that all it is? 5,500 years. Just 5,500 yeah, years. Sure, Don't you sure. worry about it. Oh, then. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll take care of that. Yeah. But humanity has to cleanse itself of sin because we can't bring sin with us that to the other side. God doesn't want that. The only way to do that is to die. And the thing is, is that you don't have to fear death. There's nothing to fear there. We only die once. Isn't that we right? We only do it once. That's right. Okay. I'm just checking with you. Yep. But I mean, really, we don't have to. What are you so scared about? Now, I, I, that's a, that's a, that's false too, right, Kev? Sometimes you can die more than once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the old saw is, you know, well, I'm not afraid of death, but it's just the manner in which I die. So, that, yeah, that okay, we can true. have that discussion. But we're talking about destinations here. But get back to this equally yoked. 
Yeah. It is much better to go through life, whatever it is, however it is, if you have an equally yoked partner that both both of you are tuned into the Holy Spirit, okay? And you can play off each other. You can support each other. You can talk to one another. Can you imagine the kind of conversation you have if you are speaking in two different languages? Because if one does not have the Holy Spirit, you're talking talking in a different language with each other, and you're trying to make yourself understood. This is, you want to talk about marriage counseling, okay? Here's marriage counseling 101 wrapped up in a little bow. Have the same language, okay? Then you can solve your problems. Then you can start, if you're starting new in a brand new marriage with someone who has the Holy Spirit, and both of you are following the precepts, listening to the Holy Spirit talking to you, you're going to start off on the right foot. Absolutely. I got a, I got a little uh, special story yeah. to take about a minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, but, we you got know, 12 here, minutes. here at TFR, I kind of look at us, even though we all have our differences, folks, we all are really kind of equally yoked and in this, in this journey together. And it's, um, and what it does is it brings forth good fruits that, you know, attract more people and consequently makes better change. And I applaud each and every one of you out there listening for who you are and what your efforts. Like I said, we don't all have to be and think the same. Our journeys are all different. So it would be yes, illogical for us to, to all think the same and have the same opinions and everything else. It's, it's, it's crazy, but I want to, you know, just a, a good uh, example is our friends, uh, uh, Stefan and Star, Star in the chat room. Um, they were brought together through this. And I can only see an amazing thing taking place here as they um, you know embark on this on this journey together. I think that's freaking fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. And it was brought together. They're equally yoked and of and they're coming from good, good seed here, you know, and, and that, that the TFR family. So, I mean, I'm just absolutely thrilled to see that that's coming together, that that's taking place and that TFR has become the match.com. Well, I'm going to share media. something with you very circumspectly. Okay. Okay. In other words, no names. But TFR is a pretty good dating service. <laughs> Pretty good matching service. That's about as far as I'm going to go with that one. Too. Okay. Okay. It have, yeah, it does have its ways, doesn't there it? There are little spiffs along the way here. All right. I'm going to do a commercial right now. Okay. Because we only yes. got 10 minutes and I want to make By sure this means. gets in here. Go ahead. Shameless and, and one. If you're just going to drag me off to Freaky Friday, then you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll continue this conversation. And I really encourage everybody that's here right now on the Entangled Show to join us on Freaky Friday because I am going to continue off into the never-never land of Wookiees. So here we go. I announced at the beginning of this show that we are now taking the name The Anthony Patch Show and calling it The Entangled Program with Anthony Patch and Kev Baker. And our guest today is Joe Joseph. I'm taking that branding name of Entangled, which applies to the online magazine through my website at anthonypatch.com, the Entangled magazine that comes out the first of every month. And we are going to apply that brand name, Entangled, to a worldwide online conference. For the first time, Kev Baker and I, and Joe, you're probably going to get dragged and hijacked into this too so you better hold on this is called entangled 2017 worldwide online conference where serious minds meet now we have a target of around the first of september we are going to do what appears to be all subject to change this is just the leadings of the lord so far that we are going to do a two-day live stream event We will have guest speakers one at a time presenting for an hour and then followed by anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes of my interviewing that guest speaker and online chat submission of questions 
questions for the speaker. So that's where it is so far. That's all that I can really tell you. This is all preliminary. But the Holy Spirit is saying this is time to reach a bigger audience. This is not about making money. This is about spreading the message out to as big an audience as we can possibly get in these end times. Because we have August 21st, a full solar eclipse streaking across the United States, a harbinger to the Gentiles, not the Jews, a harbinger to the Gentiles. That's the unsaved. Okay? So we are talking about September 23rd, Revelation 12, signs in the heavens, the dragon. Okay? All this stuff going on. The Lord impressed upon me and a good friend just yesterday that we need to put on something that will reach more people sandwiched in between this eclipse and whatever it is that the signs in the heavens are portending around September 23rd. It may only be something spiritually that manifests on the 23rd. I think it's going to be the announcement by the Pope of a literal one world religion being declared, but we'll see. Don't hold me to that. It's just, you know, where I have my suspicions. But in this time frame in which possibly we are looking at the beginning, literally, okay, I'll, I'll go on record. I'll go on record. And I can be wrong, but I'm going to go on record. I believe that September indicates the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. Okay? I'm not talking rapture. I'm not talking about anything. I'm talking about seven years years of tribulation. The worst of it is the latter half, the three and a half years. Possibly we're seeing that indicated in Revelation 12. Now, it may only be initially a spiritual aspect of the seven years of tribulation, but who knows? It may manifest physically. Well, we'll see. Um, you know what, Tony? Maybe uh, what we'll have to do is arrange... We'll, we'll have to powwow on that one because because okay. um, uh, th there's no way we could get into that right now. But maybe offline we can have a discussion. I got to get Ange involved in that one, too, because yeah, she's please. got a unique perspective on that, that that um, yeah, I think you would really enjoy. I mean, th that's the other thing, too, is what this evokes as far as fellowship. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. and that doesn't mean brick and mortar churches, by the way. No, 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 no. Yeah. So, yeah, this, let's have that. I always like talking to you. So, yeah, we'll have a conversation. We'll bring it back after we come to some conclusions, some some suppositions, some speculation, perhaps. And we'll bring it back to the audience next week. Oh, that sounds fabulous. Shameless one. Um, there you go. We got oh, about you know five minutes. It would have go to ahead be in wrap two it weeks because it would have to be in two weeks because uh, next Friday I'm taking up working for the man. OK, <laughs> no, whatever, whatever. <laughs> we can do it on one of Kev's hours next week. Excellent. Even better. We'll just hijack his show. I like oh, that. Don't let him hijack my show, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> did you just wake up? No, I'm sitting here listening he to you guys. Did you hear that? Huh? Huh? Yeah. You know, I'm I'm getting a little bit scared here because I hear you guys talking about all this stuff, and you're so well versed in all of this, and here I am just new to this I, I don't think i'll ever be as well versed and knowledgeable I, I that exact same thing bro told her that exact same thing it just happens it happens uh, do you think what did we plan any of this did you what i woke up hey man you're coming on the air with me and tony tonight it's like a, a record scratch oh no. this was i mean i mean this was, I've, <laughs> sat here, I've listened to this and i mean something did take over you guys because like Tony said, this was meant to be just maybe one segment of the show. We would bring everyone up to speed with Entangled, etc. And then we'd get into the usual AI stuff. But you guys getting together, wow, this is a message, obviously very timely, that had to go out. Awesome yeah, we were that, even uh, going to talk about smart toilets today and look at awesome. where we went. Well, we have that's good because we have absolutely no, con no content for Freaky. So it, oh, we, we can talk we about get. smart toilets. There's a great hook. Uh, the right, internet of toilets. All and right, also, audience, if you want something fun to talk about, we're going to talk about toilets and balls. 
And also, there's a new dominant species on the planet, and it ain't us. Oh, yeah, sure. So lots to talk about on Freaky Friday, so I encourage everybody to stay just, tuned for three hours of fun-filled up, yeah. excitement and jocularity. Now, that Kevin will... makes it up. There's Oh, come on. Yeah. The, the only way that there could be a, a, a race that's better than us, it has to come out of the Vatican. Because, you know, the Vatican, they're everything. You know, the Jesuits. Ooh, the big bad Jesuits. Mm. Yeah. Uh-huh. So maybe, just, maybe just, they created it down in the dungeons of the Vatican. It's just as freaky. Um, well, almost. It's hey coming guys, out of Microsoft. I'm down here <laughs> in the dungeons of the Vatican, and I can tell you that um, it's really not what it's cracked up to be. Oh, I can hear that. I can hear the yeah. water dripping down the walls. Absolutely. Oh, it's horrible. Oh, oh yes. Look at all that mold. Oi, so you're going you to talk clean about down Microsoft. Here. Oi, little bleach, please. Yeah, you're going to talk about Microsoft? Well, they're the ones that are claiming there's a new dominant species on what? this planet. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. Well, Bill you, you Gates see. and his vaccinations. <laughs> He's uh, involved. Hey, guys, we need a coroner down here, too. Apparently, there was a few too many ritual sacrifices. Do you need a paramedic? <laughs> no, not necessary. There'd have uh, to be somebody that's living down here for that. Yeah. Okay. I'll throw the defibrillator away. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this is going to be fun tonight, folks. We're, we're just about wrapping up the and Entangled and course, program. And, of course, we have um, also our the Woo Crew. Uh, it looks like uh, Ken, uh, hopefully Ken will be there. I saw him pop into the chat. So maybe he'll make his triumphant return. Johnny King, you said, is coming by, huh, Kev? Oh, so I heard. <laughs> Holy moly. So, our, so my, uh, my pagan brother from another mother will be there. We've got Johnny Wessels. He'll be the there. Whistler? Yeah. Scotty so I mean, Lopez. Oh, oh it's just, hey, it's, hey, uh, Johnny Wess. Okay, Joe, you haven't heard this. Um, my friend wants to um, buy a dog and name that dog Johnny Whistles. Did you hear about that? <laughs> no, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, a lab. What an honor. Yeah, a yellow lab named Johnny Whistles. What a great name for a dog, for a that lab. That is a great name for a, for a dog. It is. It's fantastic. The Whistler. The Whistler. Because you Oof. whistle to your dog to make him come to you, right? Oof. So there he is. There he is, Johnny Whistle. So he had a great kick out of that. All right, wrap fantastic. it up, Kev. Wrap it up. Well, folks, that is the end for another week. Almost. Because now we are going to transition into the place that resides in between the Twilight Zone and the X-Files. Better known as Freaky Friday with the Woo Crew. We will see you all after the break with some additions as well. Remember, join us next week for the Entangled Radio Show with Anthony Patch and me, Kev Baker. Stay tuned. We will be right back. 